This video is part two in a two-part series. You can watch part one by clicking the link on the top right of your screen. When we left off, the Germans had just finished ravaging Belarus, enslaving and murdering its citizens, and destroying its infrastructure. Those citizens and infrastructure were the main providers of the partisan supplies. The Bielski group now must find a way to survive without the help of the Belarusians. At first glance, the ruins of the Belarusian villages seem totally barren, but on closer inspection, most of the destroyed buildings left behind usable materials, many farm animals were set free rather than killed, and the orchards and wheat fields were left completely untouched. If anything, the partisans might be better supplied now than any time before. And even better, the Soviets started directly supporting the partisans from the air. Although more Soviet support also meant more Soviet control. While he resisted as much as he could, Tuvia was eventually forced to accept a Russian commissar into the unit. This was dangerous. A commissar's first loyalty was to the Communist Party and Secret Service. Tuvia was basically admitting a spy into his unit. What's worse is that Tuvia was not exactly a communist, leading his unit in a rather authoritarian manner. And worst of all, if the commissar was just plain anti-Semitic, no one could stop him from lying about the unit and having it destroyed. The man the Russians sent was named Shematovitz, who happened to be married into a very religious Jewish family. While a loyal communist through and through, he was quite sympathetic to the Jewish plight, and whenever sympathy wasn't enough, Shematovitz was quite fond of alcohol. Tuvia was not only relieved, but even happy to welcome this valuable addition into the Otriad. Speaking of which, let's take a look at the Bielski Otriad's makeup. The majority were non-fighting civilians. Most, like the Bielskis themselves, came from the bottom classes of society. This background gave them the skills they needed to survive out in the woods. Meanwhile, those from the upper classes were quite useless. This led to a totally inverted social hierarchy, where intellectuals and politicals were at the bottom, while fighters and craftsmen were at the top. Anti-elitism was a common theme among the partisans. Something they particularly delighted in was coarse language. In male conversation, the words woman and whore were often used interchangeably, and a favorite pastime of everyone was heavy drinking. The Bielski brothers were heavy drinkers themselves, setting a bad example for their followers. But at the very least, alcohol abuse did help endear them to their Russian allies. By the fall of 1943, the Otriad began to shift its focus. On top of making regular supply runs to the villages, they started to take full advantage of their growing number of craftsmen. Once a total liability, the large civilian population of the Bielski camp would become its greatest asset. Some of the facilities they built for their craftsmen included an extremely important gun repair shop, a woodworking shop, a blacksmith, a sausage factory, a flour mill, a barber shop, a watch repair shop. That one's a little odd, but watches were very prestigious among the partisans, so other units were willing to pay a premium to keep their watches in working order. There was also a tailor shop, which the women of the Otriad were major contributors to. It was also the Otriad's primary source of gossip, usually about the unit's commanders and their many mistresses. There was a tannery, which doubled as the Otriad synagogue since many of the tanners happened to be Orthodox Jews. And finally, since cleanliness was particularly important out in the woods, the Otriad set up a soap factory, and later, a much prized Turkish bathhouse. In theory, all members of the Otriad were entitled to these services free of charge, but for the most in-demand services, compensation was expected. But if men from the other Otriads wanted the Bielski services, they'd always have to pay. But trade wasn't the only benefit of these facilities. If Tuvia ever had an issue with one of his Soviet higher-ups, he'd give them a tour of the camp, showing them just how useful it was to the partisans' logistics, and of course, bribing him with whatever they had on hand that day. Tuvia humorously justifies this by saying, Our Jewish laws say do not take bribes, so I did not take. But the laws do not say don't give, so I gave. At any given time, the Bielski Otriad had between 10 and 30 children in it. Everyone was proud to have them, since they saw it as their way of protecting their future from the Nazis. However, many of those children had lost their parents, and many parents in the Otriad lost their children. So these broken families put themselves back together through adoptions, helping them recover part of their lost lives. The children of the camp grew to idealize the unit's fighters, and quickly picked up on their obscene language and brutish attitudes. One particular child, around four years old, would come to Tuvia every morning, salute, and say, Commander, allow me to report that in our Zemlanka, whoring has been taking place. Naturally, everyone thought that this kid was hilarious, and showered him with favors at every opportunity. The camp's love of children meant that babies would have been a welcome addition, but many believed that it would be wrong to bring children into the world at this time. So since many of the young women were sexually active, abortions were common. But, unfortunately, even though the camp had a skilled gynecologist on hand, given the circumstances, many of the women ended up having fertility issues after the procedure, and one even died. But some women did choose to carry through and become mothers. Two or three new babies were born into the Bielski Otriad. 
Speaking of women, the women of the Bielski camp were in a rather unique situation. With few having useful skills like nursing, most found themselves at the bottom of the social ladder. They also weren't allowed to own guns, an arrangement which most were fine with, but it did limit their upward mobility. So like in most of history, a woman's best opportunity for advancement was marriage. The couples the Bielski Otriad produced were rather unique. Once upper class women were suddenly considering men who in their past lives they never would have even noticed. This led to many relationships between rough and simple peasant men and educated and elegant upper class women. The men in these relationships were known as Tavos, and whatever status a girl's Tavo had would automatically transfer over to her. Although, getting these girls still wasn't easy. Some aspiring Tavos had to break their future wives' families out of ghettos before getting to consummate the relationship. As the Oshriad grew, there came a need for a criminal justice system. The most common punishment was a multi-day stint in the prisons in Lanka, but serious crimes were punished with execution. One of the members of the Otriad was a lawyer, so he became their official prosecutor. Of particular interest were cases where Jews who collaborated with the Nazis came asking for protection. Each case was treated differently, and had a different outcome, ranging from being allowed to join to the death penalty. As the months went on, the camp grew, and all of the partisans found themselves in possession of more and more wealth. German weakness begat partisan strength. Finally enjoying a certain level of comfort, the Bielski Otriad started to explore its Jewish heritage. While the Soviets looked down on and often outright banned religious events, everyone in the Otriad, including the Commissar, was happy to do them anyway. So expeditions always kept an eye out for instruments to bring back to them. Soon, the camp had a trio consisting of a guitar, a violin, and a mandolin, which would usually perform alongside a choir. The most common types of music that they played was patriotic Soviet music, but traditional Jewish folk could also be heard. At one point, the camp put on a show for the other partisan units, including a Soviet-style parade. Many attended, and the event was a huge success. With the approach of the 1944 Passover holiday, Tuvia was presented with a delegation from the Orthodox Jews asking to bake matzah. Tuvia deferred to the commissar, who personally gave the order to bake them. That Passover was celebrated in the traditional manner, but instead of discussing the Jews' departure from Egypt, this Passover was spent recollecting their departure from the ghettos. A few weeks after Passover, Operation Bagration, the great Soviet invasion of Belarus and the Baltics, began. The thunderous sounds of combat could be heard closer and closer to the camp. Retreating Germans were hunted down by the partisans, and the Bielskis joined them. At one point, three SS officers were captured and interrogated. Then, one was brought before the Otriad's general population. Everyone was in a furor. Past German prisoners claimed not to know what was happening to the Jews, so while it was possible that they were telling the truth, the SS officers definitely knew. The situation deteriorated quickly, until the oldest man in the Otriad, somewhere in his late 70s or early 80s, emerged with a knife and screamed, God, my grandfather was not a murderer. My father was not a murderer, but I will be a murderer. The whole crowd stopped and watched as he killed the SS officer. The other two were shot shortly after. A few days later, a small German unit, desperate, hungry, but still disciplined, ran into the camp and began throwing grenades into huts and shooting at anyone they could find. The entire Otriad ran into a nearby swamp, while the fighters launched a counterattack. Partisans from other units joined them, and by the end, all of the Germans were dead. But 11 partisans died, and more were wounded. Right after the dead were buried, a group of Red Army soldiers wandered into camp. The soldiers couldn't believe what they were seeing. Jewish partisans, and so many of them. And that was it. For the partisans, the war was over. The Bielski unit was ordered to gather in the town of Noah Grodak with the other partisans. And so, the Bielski Otriad, with its over 1,200 members, began their final march. Along the way, they got to witness the results of the genocide the Germans had committed. Once thriving Jewish communities had completely disappeared, their homes filled with new occupants. And so, after a final military parade, the Bielski Otriad was officially disbanded. But, in spite of the festivities, the Soviets were not actually happy to have these people in their territory. Partisans were highly individualistic and uncooperative, so the NKVD immediately set about collecting denouncements so they could imprison these former heroes. The Bielski family were no exception, so the Otriad rapidly dispersed. The Bielski family ended up split between the United States and British Palestine, soon to be Israel. But one of the brothers, Asael, was drafted into the Red Army and died fighting at Konigsberg. Meanwhile, Tuvia, the man who saved 1,200 people, never found much success after the war. He ended up becoming a taxi driver, and then ran a small trucking business before his death. This is one of the most incredible stories I've ever read. It almost feels like fiction at times, but it really happened. There are many lessons to be taken away from these events. I'm sure many of you have already taken yours, but I'd like to share what I think. The Jews have a saying, next year in Jerusalem. 
It's traditionally said to conclude a Passover Seder, but I never liked it. It reeks of impotence and victimhood. Perhaps hope, too, but mostly impotence. But then I heard an alternate name for the Bielski camp, Jerusalem in the Woods. And then that old Jewish saying came to my mind. Tuvia and his 1,200 men were not just survivors. They didn't just rise above victimhood. They did what Jews for thousands of years couldn't do. They did not impotently hope for Jerusalem. Instead, even as the whole world tried to kill them, they went out and built their own. And that's the story of the Bielski Partisans. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking it, leaving a comment, subscribing to the channel, and hitting the notification bell. And if you'd like to help us make more videos like this one, you can do so by supporting us through Patreon, Subscribestar, or PayPal, links to which can be found below. Up next, we're going to make a long-awaited return to philosophy. I'll see you then. Be the hunter, not the hunter. I won't